good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Inside the Middle East, a uh, question and answer series at the Middle East Initiative. My name is Neda Zohdi. I'm a first year Masters of Public Policy uh, student here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I'm also an editor on the Harvard Journal of Middle Eastern Policy and Politics. Um, today, we're pleased to be joined with uh, Dr. Khalil al -Anani. Um, Dr. Khalil is an adjunct professor at the School of Advanced and International Studies at John Hopkins University. Um, he was also previously a resident scholar at the Middle East Institute and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institute. Um, Dr. Khalil, thank you so much for joining us. Today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so the first question we'd like to begin with um, has to do with political Islam, an area of your expertise. Um, we would love to hear from you about how you um, think the Muslim Brotherhood has responded to the challenges that they've faced in Egypt uh, since the summer, since Morsi was taken out of power. Um, you've written before that Islamists have tended to adapt uh, when they're faced with these challenges. Um, and I wonder if you think that, you, that the Brotherhood has been able to effectively respond to the crackdown and to the removal of President Morsi. Well, I think when it comes to the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the movement since last July until now is in a disarray. And they, to a large extent, doesn't have a, a strategy or a plan on how to deal with the coup and its consequences. And what worries me is about the, the lack of wisdom uh, among uh, the young members of the MB uh, because the, uh, the, the lack of communication between the uh, first line leadership and between the grassroots. Uh, the MB, uh, since last July until now, uh, they focus mainly on how to make the life of the current government harder and harder and try to create uh, problems for them. They play the spoiler game more than uh, rational, rational one. So I think uh, the movement is facing one of its historical crises uh, that they uh, faced over the last five or six decades. And the main goal for the movement now is, is how to exist, how to survive, how uh, to uh, uh, maintain its place on Egyptian politics. The question is, to what extent the movement can do that? And this would depend on the response of the government to this. And do you think that the crisis um, that you've just mentioned that the Brotherhood is experiencing in Egypt, um, does that have any implications or effects for some of the other Islamist parties in other parts of the region? Absolutely. I would say uh, it's very connected when you look at the, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt uh, and what happened with them and its impact on, let's say, the uh, Nahda in Tunis, for instance. I would say that the Nahda, they learned the lesson from what happened with the MB and they tried to be more, uh, I would say, uh, moderate and flexible in giving uh, concessions to the uh, secular and liberal forces. On the other hand, uh, what's happening now, uh, uh, particularly in the Gulf, and it's uh, the, I mean, the, the current uh, uh, repression against the MB has something to do with the, what happened with the MB in Egypt. In, in other words, uh, the, the downfall of the MB uh, that happened last July in Egypt affected the political Islam in the region and affected its credibility and its appeal. And, and I would say the Islamism as an ideology now has lost a lot of its credibility, a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of its appeal, uh, particularly uh, after the failure of the Muslim Brotherhood in maintaining power and its inability to govern Egypt over the last year. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the Gulf, um, we heard last week that Saudi Arabia came out and um, declared the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization. Um, could you comment on uh, this decision and how some of uh, Saudi Arabia's neighbors have also responded to this? I would say this decision was driven by two main factors. The first one is the sense of insecurity and lack of self-confidence among Saudis and United Arab Emirates that they think that uh, the, the, the main enemy right now uh, is not a regional force or power, it is mainly the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think uh, they have, have the sense of insecurity because the crackdown against the MB might lead to some uh, retaliation from its supporters. And this, these supporters are around the Gulf. The second uh, factor behind uh, uh, this decision is uh, the regional game that is playing out now between uh, within the GCC uh, among Gulf uh, countries. So I think uh, the decision meant mainly to, to send a message to Qatar, which is supposed to be supporter of, of the MB, uh, to stop uh, uh, well, well, I mean, what's happening right now. Uh, but I would say uh, this decision might backfire in the future because uh, if we look at the MB or the Muslim Brotherhood, we're not talking about a religious party. We're talking about a massive social movement that has supporters everywhere in the region. 
Uh, so uh, we never know what would be the consequences of such a decision at the moment. Interesting. And how do you think that the um, current Egyptian government uh, perceives this decision and, and kind of the regional dynamics that you just mentioned? Well, I think the decision by Saudi Arabia uh, 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 to designate the, the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization uh, was built on what happened in Egypt over the last few months. Uh, uh, if we go back uh, last December, uh, uh, the Egyptian government designated the MB as a terrorist organization. And this is I would say it was a very political decision, uh, frankly. I mean, it has nothing to do uh, with the MB as uh, an Islamist movement. Uh, uh, the Saudi Arabia has try tried to show some, you know, uh, uh, sympathy with the Egyptian government. And I think there is uh, some kind of silent agreement between uh, uh, the acts of moderation, of, uh, so to speak, uh, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, to put an end to the Muslim Brotherhood. But again, the question is to what extent this might succeed on the one hand, and to what extent it might backfire in these governments on the other hand. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, uh, what do you think about the likelihood of you know, these steps being taken actually succeeding and quelling this, uh, the, the movement? Or do you think it's more likely to backfire? Uh, well, I would say it would affect the movement, uh, in the movement in the short term, absolutely. Uh, there is, uh, this is one of the heaviest crackdown campaigns against the MB since, I would say, 60s. I remember back 60s. Uh, the MB members who fled Egypt, they take a refuge at Saudi Arabia. Now it's the opposite now. Uh, 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 Saudi Arabia is going after them and they arrest uh, their leaders there. Uh, so at the moment, absolutely, this would affect the, the Muslim Brotherhood ability to mobilize and to get support uh, from other uh, you know, uh, people. But on the long term, I would say this might encourage the extreme uh, uh, movements and radical movements uh, uh, to, 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 to start to recruit new members and try to capitalize on such atmosphere. And this is, I would say, this is a very uh, good environment for such ideas to, to flourish and to thrive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and turning more specifically towards the polit current political climate in Egypt, um, some people argue that the level of polarization right now is at an unprecedented high and, you know, maybe something Egypt has never seen before. Um, do you think that there are any actors in Egypt right now that are able to successfully overcome that polarization and really start to try to build bridges in the society that's so divided? Unfortunately, I don't think so. Uh, the current moment, Egypt reveals uh, deep division, uh, polarization, and uh, uh, contestation of, over you know, every single issue in Egypt. You cannot find such consensus. So I don't think that in the foreseeable future that Egypt would have such responsible political force that can bridge this gap. Uh, what's happening now is the zero-sum game that those are in power now, uh, namely uh, the military and its supporters are from the so-called liberal and secular forces, on the one hand, and Islam, on the other hand, they don't have such compromising mindset, at the moment at least, and uh, they have their own reasons for this. So, uh, to a large extent, I really doubt that uh, Egypt would reach to some kind of reconciliation, I would say, in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you were able to envision uh, the future of Egypt, say, in the next several years, um, and that the country had achieved political stability, um, if you could only select kind of one policy or one political change that could take place, what do you think would be the most important step towards that direction of achieving political stability? Well, I think the most important one is dialogue and, to, uh, and inclusion as well. Uh, without dialogue and inclusion, I don't think that Egypt would be able to achieve any kind of stability. Uh, remember, uh, one of the main reasons behind the 2011 revolution was the exclusion of other forces. And the revolution happened to include these forces. Now what's happening in Egypt is the same thing that happened before the revolution in the first place. So without having such kind of dialogue, uh, political inclusion, I don't think that Egypt would be able to uh, bring stability in the future. Okay. Um, and maybe just as a final question, um, so how do you think uh, Egyptians and also the international community will look back on this tumultuous three-year period that's taken place since the revolution began. Um, how do you think people will characterize this, this initial transition phase, and what do you think will be the most important um, takeaways from that? Well, I think what's happening now in Egypt is uh, part of the nature of transition, which, mainly, uh, which is mainly uncertain process that you don't know what would be the outcome of this process. So I think in the future, when people look back, they would be struck by two things. The first one is the, the failure of the political class in Egypt and their inability uh, to include uh, uh, all forces. The second is the, uh, the silence uh, 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 
over the killing of many Egyptians, which they paid a lot of a price uh, for, 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 for freedom, uh, as well as for political conflict. So I think uh, a sense of regret might, might prevail in the future, and, and, but I think this would be a bit late. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.